So I want you to think about something. It's June 3rd, 1861. It's dawn. The Union Army is quietly coming out of the woods into an open area near a town called Philippi in what is now West Virginia. In a tent in the middle of a field is a young engineering student named James Hanger. <clears throat> James doesn't know that his officers should have posted a perimeter guard around their encampment because James only joined the Army the day before yesterday. Uh, so when the first gunshots go off and bullets start flying, he, along with the rest of the uh, Confederate encampment, burst out of their tents and just start running in utter confusion in their underwear. And the, the Union press, kind of unkindly, didn't call it the Battle of Philippi. They called it the Philippi Races. Uh, for first uh, land battle of the Civil War. <clears throat> and just about the first cannon shot went right through James Hanger's leg. He was the first amputee in the Civil War. So he goes home, he recovers, and then he starts tinkering. He's an engineer. He develops the first prosthetic leg made out of barrel staves with a little hinge at the knee. The Hanger Company is still in business today. They make these prosthetic arms and legs that you see people running through airports with. Uh, and they are a tremendous leader They're, they, in Austin, Texas. This is a great company. That was a terrible, terrible conflict over terrible, terrible ideas. And today we have a terrible, terrible conflict over terrible ideas. A and I'm not talking about the presidential debates. <laughs> I'm talking about what's going on with our climate, our environment, and with sustainability. Out of that conflict of the Civil War, a tremendous number of innovations and co great companies came. And this year and next year, there are just a wave of American companies that are celebrating their 150th birthday coming out of that conflict. Companies like Procter & Gamble, Heinz, uh, Sherwin-Williams, that took innovations that were developed in that conflict and then brought them to the world. And they're part of our world today. And today and yesterday, we saw and we continue to see companies that are going to be part of the next 150 years waves of innovations. We're going to see companies that will be great companies celebrating 150 years anniversary years from now. There's another innovation that came out of that period too, and that was the increased development of steam engines, particularly in ships. Another company that just celebrated the 150th anniversary is the, one of the parent companies of Wilenius Wilhelmsen Logistics. And many of you may know this, but for those of you who don't, WWL moves 55% of the automobiles that are shipped around the world from original manufacturers. 55%, that's a huge, huge company with a huge devotion to sustainability, to developing people, to society and culture. Ray Fitzgerald uh, is a friend, has been one of the founders of Ocean Exchange. He's the president of WWL Atlantic, so he's in charge of most of that traffic. Sort of imagine a really, really grand admiral with a grand fleet, and that's Ray. Would you please welcome the chairman of the board of Ocean Exchange, Ray Fitzgerald. I feel like I should pipe you aboard. Very good, Dane. <laughs> wow, wow, what an introduction. Good morning, everyone. It is my privilege to kick off day two of the Ocean Exchange, and I can promise you that we'll keep the energy level of the last day and a half up all through today, right to the dinner, where the Oracell and Navigator prizes will be awarded. So a special welcome to all returning delegates. Very happy to, very happy to see you again and also a warm welcome to all the new delegates who are attending for the first time. I hope you find that the Ocean Exchange adds value and that in the future you will return and become more engaged in the Ocean Exchange ecosystem. WWL is proud to be a partner too 
and a sponsor of the Ocean Exchange. And today, I have three things that I want to cover for you. First, I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of what Wallenius Wilhelmsen Logistics is. I will tell you, it is the most interesting company that many of you have never heard of. I'll tell you what we do, where we do it, and for whom. Second, I want to share with you why the Ocean Exchange, and in particular, this forum, has become very, very important for us to promote our global commitment to sustainability. And then lastly, last year I updated you on the formation of the um, Trident Alliance. I will share with you how the Trident Alliance has evolved over time. I have to regretfully make a correction on, on uh, Dame's very wonderful opening, but we carry as a group 30% of the new cars that travel around the world. 55% of what we carry roughly is automobiles, and I think therein was the confusion, so thank you for that. Okay, compliments to Jane Austen for inspiring us for this, for this opening slide. I'll come back to that picture in a moment. Okay, Wilenius Wilhelmsen is the combination of two historic Scandinavian shipping companies. Wilenius is a Swedish-based company in out of Stockholm that was founded in 1934. Wilhelmsen is a Norwegian-based company uh, out of Oslo that was founded in 1861. They were and continue to be independent companies. They are the investors in Wilhelmsen Wilhelm Logistics. As globalization really started to take hold in the 1990s, they found that they could achieve more working together as one than they could separately in the different areas of the world in which they operated. So in 1999, they ceded the operations of the trades that their ships uh, worked in and formed WWL. And that is the company that I am a part of. So a little bit of history there, and then just a quick snapshot of WWL by the numbers. WWL has a global team of about 6,000 employees on five continents around the world. We have 60 vessels that trade across six continents. And our vessels vary from 600 feet in length to nearly 900 feet in length. And you can see the cutaway. Some have as many as 13 decks, and we carry a mixture of cars, what we call high and heavy, which is mining machinery, construction equipment, and agricultural machinery. And then we have project cargo, which are big name shippers like Boeing and GE and Siemens and people of that ilk that give us oversized equipment that rolls on the vessel and rolls off the vessel. So our founding roots are as a shipping company, but we are really more than that. We have a factory to dealer vision where we wanna work with manufacturers to move their products from their factories to the dealer destination. So that of course implies more than just ocean transportation. We can do trucking, we, can, we have collaboration with different railroads around the world, we have terminals that we operate and we have a, a supply chain management concept. So we have software and analytics and staff that can help you improve your efficiencies in your outbound supply chain. On top of that, we have vehicle processing companies. And in North America alone, we process four and a half million vehicles in our vehicle processing centers. And that number globally is six million vehicles. So you can see here on our ocean vessels, we have 5.1 million automobiles and heavy equipment units transported. We operate 13 global deep sea terminals that are really the nexus between the ocean and our land-based operations. And then as I said a moment ago, in 58 centers around the world, we process a little bit more than six million vehicles. So that in a nutshell is a profile on WWL. Okay, one too many. So who do we do this for? This is just a selection of some of our top customers. It is not a comprehensive list, but the who's who of all of those segments that I outlined a few moments ago are represented here in this slide. Now, as a company, we recognize that global shipping and land-based transportation has an environmental footprint. So we have a radical vision in the future to achieve zero emissions for shipping and logistics. And one of the concepts that we came up with is the vessel orosol, 
the electric vessel or a cell, or the environmental vessel or a cell. It's the zero emissions concept, and I'll start on the right side of this picture. So you can see that we've got three different energy sources. Those sails that you see at the top, are, they, cre they create wind energy. They are coated with solar panels. And underneath, there's wave energy. Based on the dynamics of waves, the paddles turn like this and generate electricity. Then in the middle, we have the energy carriers, the hydrogen electricity, and the fuel cells that store it. And then we have the energy consumers in the background to move the sails, to operate the vessel, and to maneuver. OK, so then this is a concept. And uh, I will come back to this, but the reality is the technology for this vessel does not exist. But from the time that we established this concept to today, we've really come a long way, and in large part because of Ocean Exchange and our affiliation with those of you in this room. Moving on to how do we see the future? So I think very quickly, we heard yesterday that at some point, depending on the calendar you look at, at the end of 2011 or the early part of 2012, the global population hit 7 billion people. It's forecasted to go to 9 billion people by 2050. So there is growth. There will be more consumption. From poverty to consumption in the middle, the Brookings Institute calculates that there are roughly 2 billion people in the middle class today. 750 million of those people have come in in the last decade. By 2050, or sorry, by 2030, they estimate that that number will be 5 billion people in the middle class. So people are coming up and, and they are getting more purchasing power. Two weeks ago, I was in Paris and I met with the CEO of a major global trading company and he shared with me that their business interests all around the world are fairly flat with the exception of Africa. They're seeing year over year 10% growth in Africa just because of population growth. The average woman there has five to six children. So that creates opportunity, but it also creates challenges, which I'll come back to. And then, of course, with this population growth and expendable income increasing, there is opportunity and there will be need for infrastructure and energy and the things that we move around the planet will fulfill those needs. So these are all good things from a business perspective, which is why I have the, the word business headline uh, underlined. But if you think about it, what is the footprint this creates? So we talk about the population. Back in 1960, around the time that I showed up on this planet, there were three billion people on Earth. By 2050, there will be nine. And by 2100, there will be 11 billion people. There will be enormous stress on resources, on infrastructure, on everything. So the reality is we have to do things differently than we have in the past. So I think this visual is cute, but it is time to wave goodbye to the past. The past two years, those of you who have been here, you've heard me talk about the evolution of emissions regulation. And five years ago, the IMO allowed sulfur emissions on vessels up to 4%. That's changed twice in the last five-year period. It is now 1% emissions permitted. In 2020, that number will go down to one-tenth of 1%. 1 so that, that trend will continue. There's a convergence in sustainability and consumption. And depending on your age, that defines the delta. But if you talk to some of the younger people now just coming out of university, that delta is very, very narrow and almost non-existent. This trend will continue. There are market disruptions in IT. We heard a little bit about 3D printing yesterday. I was in Japan last year with the executives from Caterpillar, and one of the think tank sessions that they had in their meeting that they included me in was, how do we 3D print the materials for heavy construction equipment at the sites where we need it and eliminate logistics needs? I didn't particularly like that conversation. But I, was a part, but I was a part of it, and it's coming, like it or not. So the question is, how do we as a logistics organization adapt? Uh, and of course, new energy resources are, are, have been self-evident in this, in this discussion. So shifts in manufacturing. In 1980, 80% 80 of the deep sea transportation for automobiles originated out of Japan. So ships like that would go to Japan, load up with cars, go to the destination, and then run back to Japan empty. That was right on cue, wasn't it? <laughs> it's hard to do that. Today, that number is less than half. And if you look at emerging markets like Mexico, 
In this decade alone, Mexico will go from producing less than 2 million vehicles a year to more than 5 million vehicles a year. So what does that do? That changes the footprint and the demographics of both production and consumption, and our ships have to go. We need more ships to call more ports and with less utilization. That creates a strain on the environment, too. So we've got to be better and smarter and use technology to improve the way we do things. So this top bullet is a great way to run a dinner party. Climate change is a reality. And what happens is when I typically make a statement like that in a large room full of business people, uh, it's amazing how pitchforks and torches all of a sudden start to appear. But it's real. And forget the cause, whatever your beliefs are. We're talking about the effect here. The effect is indisputable. 2015 was the warmest year on record. So we've got a challenge there. And with that challenge, we're starting to see un we're starting to see regulation come in at different levels with different standards that is very difficult for us to comply with around the world and also very, very expensive to comply. As in addition, customers are much more informed about sustainability initiatives. And more and more we see that when we bid on new contracts, the ticket to the dance is your sustainability. It's not your product alone, it's not your price alone. You need to have sustainability initiatives to participate and get through these processes. So these are changes that we have to adapt to. Millie likes to say that 10 years ago, sustainability to most people meant less, less consumption, conservation. But today, sustainability is completely different. It's changing behaviors. It's doing things differently. It's bringing in innovations in just different frames of mind. This is what it is. And the benefit now for business is enormous. It gives you brand differentiation, and WWL has experienced that. It gives us a commercial advantage, as I just outlined in some of our bids. And it makes you a better company. And to the last bullet down below on the box, it enables us to keep the best young people because they're fighting for something that's, that's contributing to the greater good. So business says, sense now demands a sustainable approach, and there is value in being sustainable. This is a rapidly developing uh, phenomenon and a very, very important one. So why the ocean exchange for us? The ocean exchange is very important for several reasons. You can see that the evolution of our 154 years of existence through our legacy companies have taken us through various technologies with vessels. What we see now is that the Aura cell, where we want this to become a reality by 2040, is the, the revolution that we're looking forward to. We do not think that this technology or this, uh, this goal can be achieved by incremental gains in existing technology. What we need are new and innovative, visionary uh, technologies, elegant technologies, as somebody said yesterday, created by the people in this room. This is the value that Ocean Exchange has brought to us. So the path that led us here is that we developed this Oracell concept for the Aichi uh, World's Fair, or the Expo as it's called now in 2005. Simultaneously with that entry, we won an award in Scandinavia uh, for a $100,000 prize um, re related to uh, the Thor Heyerdahl and the Kantiki Award. Instead of taking that money, we used that concept and that award as seed money to create the Oracell Award. Now, the Oracell Award is an, the Oracell is an endangered dolphin in Southeast Asia. And that's where we got the inspiration for the name. So we started to give out this award in 2007. And quite frankly, we did a very, very poor job. We had some, several people around the world trying to find uh, worthy candidates to re receive this money. And, and it just didn't work. When we found the Ocean Exchange four years ago, now we have so many worthy candidates that just show up and come to us. So this is really a great, great relationship. Um, the, li the companies listed on the top right there are the last three winners of the Oracell Award, and who knows what comes next, okay? Um, from a perspective of a partner and a sponsor, we have been exposed to so many great innovations. Not only have we invested in Oracell Award winners, but we've worked with other past finalists where we see value uh, in their technology for the business that, that we are involved in. Um, just a key point on that first one, Everybody's got, as Dane pointed out yesterday, a cell phone. 
and that cell phone is covered with Gorilla Glass. Gorilla Glass was invented in 1960 by Corning. They did it to lighten the weight of vehicles, particularly for Dodge. And then they put it on the shelf until the 1990s and when, when the phones came out. So the technologies that, we're, that we see and that we're exposed to here at the Ocean Exchange, some of them are not ready for prime time, but that doesn't mean that they won't have their day and they're not important for the future uh, of sustainability. So for us, this is a little bit of a sales pitch. I will tell you, those of you who are here for the first time, this is an incredible, incredible forum for collaboration. And we have gotten so much out of it that the investment that we do, not only to sustain the uh, Ocean Exchange with administrative support, but the $100,000 award that we give out every year has paid for itself many times over. So please get involved. All right, lastly, the Trident Alliance. So we talked a little bit about sulfur regulation earlier. And the reality is sulfur regulation is very, very expensive. Let's put aside for now the standards that vary around the world. But a scrubber is technology that I outlined in the presentation last year that those of you who saw it basically cleans the exhaust from a vessel. If we were to put a scrubber on every one of our vessels at the time of building, it adds four and a half million dollars to the cost of that vessel. We have a, almost 160 vessels in the group fleet. If we were to retrofit those vessels with scrubbers, the cost is even higher. Now, in 2020, when the standard for sulfur emissions drops to one-tenth of one percent, at today's bunker prices, if we were to comply with that, you can't do it with heavy fuel oil. We would have to shift to marine diesel oil. And the cost impact for our group at today's depressed prices would be in excess of $325 million a year. So this is significant money to comply with the regulations. And the issue here is enforcement. So the regulations are out there, they're expecting compliance, but the enforcement has been weak. And that is a concern and a challenge for us. Okay, so I talked about the value of the ocean exchange. So what we did through our Anna Larson and Roger Strevens, who some of you may have met yesterday, is we took the ocean exchange and we established a breakout group two years ago, and we laid out this problem to Roger Bowman from, from Gulfstream and several others in the room and my friend Jane Cohen, and we really got some great feedback. And a concept was born called the Trident Alliance, where we wanted to have a single focus um, industry group to, to help authorities around the world focus on enforcement. Um, and it occurred in two breakout sessions. And this last bullet, I think, speaks to it. The common interest of the industry, the environment, and the community. So when I stood up here last year and introduced the the fact that the Trident Alliance was now a reality, we had 10 members and we were waiting on five more. Today we have more than 35 members. And uh, I know uh, Lee Kinberg is here in the audience for Maersk Lines. When Maersk Lines, the biggest player in the world, joined, that really made the difference and put the Trident Alliance on the map. So this is a, this is a very important group. And this is one that we want to continue to grow and develop and it really had its uh, origins uh, right here in this room at this forum. So to wrap things up here, and I don't want to point out that uh, just the Trident Alliance uh, members are compliant. Mo most players are compliant. There are a few bad apples, though, out there in the group. And the reality is, as this cost for enforcement, especially from 2020 and beyond, starts to come into play, there will be more of a temptation not to comply. So it's very important that we have a regulatory regime and an enforcement regime in place uh, before the next change. So in summary, weak enforcement is bad for all, and the authorities must engage in, in active global enforcement. So three things I wanted to cover. One was Wallenius Wilhelmsen Logistics, a company that you have now all heard of. Number two, I wanted to outline why this forum is important to us. And I've made that point several times. And then lastly, uh, the Trident Alliance is very, very important. And anyone here who thinks they can add value and help, we would welcome your participation. Thank you very much for your time. And with that, I introduce Warren Harris from Tata.